Well, thank you so much for your patience as I have been struggling with this technology, but I think we are good now. Well, welcome again this morning to the Valley Fellowship Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I am just so, so happy to be here. Now, this morning, we are continuing a sermon series started by Pastor Reed, which is Doctrines for Disciples. This sermon series is going through Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and talking about these foundational doctrines of Christ. We've gone through the first five up until this point, ending with the resurrection of the dead, and today we will be focusing on the sixth and final one, which is the eternal judgment. Now, the goal of this sermon series is not just to understand what these doctrines are, but we have a very special mission statement here at Valley Fellowship that is to grow deep, to go out, and to make disciples. Now, the goal is so that we can all understand how to make disciples by understanding what these doctrines are. And when people have questions for us, we can know how to answer those questions, how to use the Bible to show people the good news of Christ. So that is what we'll be looking at today. Now, last week with Pastor Reed, you were able to see the truth about the resurrection of the dead, the fact that upon death, we are not immediately going into some sort of afterlife, but instead we are simply asleep, waiting for the blessed day when we are resurrected in Christ. And what a wonderful truth that is, something that gives people peace and a hope in understanding that nothing is going on right now except their loved ones are resting. What a blessed truth that is. And today we'll be covering the eternal judgment. And it's important because it has the power to affect how we view the character of our God. Now this morning, uh, we're going to say a quick word of prayer. And then we'll dive into the message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again so much for the privilege to be here worshiping together. Lord, you promise when two or three are gathered together that you are there in their presence. Lord, we claim that promise this morning, and we welcome you. We welcome you into our hearts, Lord. We pray that the Holy Spirit would impress upon us today. Help us to learn and to be able to draw closer to you, Lord. Help these words not be mine, but help them to be yours. We love you and we thank you. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this morning, I really hope you enjoy reading, because we will be digging into Scripture this morning. So brace yourselves for a little bit. We're going to have quite a few verses because I don't want to sit up here and tell you all anything that I think. I simply want to allow the Bible to talk for itself. Amen. Amen. Now this morning, let's jump into John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. The Bible says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, the voice of God, and come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, this is immediately showing us that very clearly there are two distinct resurrections. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know that I very clearly think that one of them sounds a lot better than the other one. <laughs> I very much would like to be a part of the resurrection of life. Now, we can see that we understand that, okay, there will be resurrections. We understand what's happening until the resurrection. Everyone is sleeping. But what happens at that resurrection? What is next? Well, Christ was an expert at explaining truths through stories. And he has a parable that tells us a little bit about what happens at and around the resurrection. If we go to Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 24, the Bible, Christ speaking, says another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, weeds, among the wheat, and went his way. But then the grain had sprouted and produced a crop. Well, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Well, how then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. 
The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather up the tares? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Amen. That is the parable of the sower. And thankfully, I do not have to do a single thing to interpret this this morning because Christ did it for us. The interpretation goes as this. Just shortly after, Jesus says that he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, this parable that Christ has set forth and this interpretation shows us very clearly that the wheat and the tares are to grow together until the time of the end. Nothing happens to them until the time comes. So, there is a delayed reward The wheat is not gathered into the barn, into the kingdom of the Father, until the time of the end. And the tares are not gathered and burned until the time of the end. There's that time of delay, the time when the dead are resting. But at the time of the end, well, we have to have a judgment to figure out who is sent into the kingdom, into the barn, and who is sent into the fire. So the Bible and Christ describes what that judgment process looks like. Moving a few verses further in Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you accursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So we have this heavenly scene of judgment where the good are on the right side, the evil are on the left side, and the Father says that the evil should go into the fires that are prepared for the devil and his angels. So our first note, note number one, about the judgment is that there is everlasting fire that is prepared for the wicked. Everlasting fire. The first thing that we know about the judgment. But the Old Testament gives us a little bit more context about the judgment. In the book of Ezekiel, it summarizes the history of sin and where everything began, and then where everything will end with sin. It says, you were the anointed cherub who covers Now, the covering cherub were the angels who were so close to God that they were directly beside his throne. They were able to be in the very presence of God throughout their lives. Now, do we know who this cherub we are talking about here? This was Lucifer. This was the highest-ranking angel, the angel who was right beside God. And this is what the Scripture says about him. You were the anointed cherub who covers I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. 
Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and it turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. It's both the beginning of sin and the end of sin, with the first sin of Lucifer and the destruction of Lucifer. Note number two about the judgment. Satan shall be no more forever. That fire that we saw that was prepared for the devil and his angels destroys Satan. That is a blessing that I cannot wait to happen because the world will be a whole much of a better place without the tempter in it. And I cannot wait for that day. Can't come soon enough. But moving on, preparing for note number three about the judgment, there's some more context that the Old Testament gives us about the judgment itself. It says, for behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall with healing in his wings and shall go out and grow fat like the stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. From Malachi chapter 4. So note number three, the wicked become ashes. Just like the devil is destroyed, it says that the wicked become ashes. Now that's the day of judgment when this happens, when the bodies of the wicked are destroyed. But the Bible goes on in Matthew chapter 10 to elaborate on that. It says, and do not fear those who kill the body that cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So note number four, the destruction of the soul. Now this is a very interesting idea in all of Christendom because traditionally we hear that there is an immortal soul, that the soul lives forever. But yet the Bible talks about the possibility for the soul to be destroyed in hell. Now finally, we have one last verse here. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. Everlasting destruction. Now, I hope you all have enjoyed that little book that we have read. But we can take a little bit of a break before we jump into more reading. Now, I'm going to put my friend on the spot because I have not discussed any of this. Daniel, would you mind coming up here? <laughs> it is so good to see Daniel. I have not seen Daniel for weeks. My goodness, come here and give me a hug. So good to see you. Daniel, you're my friend. Now, this is a historical, historically accurate reinterpretation of how Daniel and I became friends. When Daniel and I became friends, I came up to him. I said, Daniel, I think you're a really cool guy. I want to be your friend. But you know what? Um, I, I really want this to happen. So in case you say no, with my phone here, you see, I've, I've done something really, really special. I've wired explosives to your place of living. And I can press a button here. And if you say no, well, <laughs> you might not like what happens. So, uh, Daniel, what do you say? Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's do and that's how we became friends. Thank you so much, Daniel. <laughs> now, that's just a silly way to look at things, but sometimes we look at God and we wonder if he made a deal like that with us. 
You see, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 tells us very clearly that God, in his very nature, is love. He loves us, and he desires for us to love him. But yet, he presents us with this choice, love me or else burn forever in hell. That does not feel very congruent with this idea of a God of love. How can he give us free will and give us such a choice as that? How is there a choice at all there? You see, there's this concept called theodicy. Perhaps some of you are very familiar with it. Perhaps I'm speaking gibberish when I say the word theodicy. But what that essentially means, according to Oxford, is the vindication of divine goodness and providence in view of the existence of evil. How can a good God allow evil to even exist? But in this circumstance, how can a good God allow people to burn forever for the crimes that they've committed in one simple lifetime? Something like that is probably what our courts would call cruel and unusual punishment. To simply exist for 20, 30, 60, 80 years. And if you don't do the right things, you could burn for millions, billions, and trillions of years. That's quite the idea. Quite an idea that leaves people exhausted and just burdened with the idea of God because how could he present us with such a choice? How could such a God be loving at all? Well, those are the questions that, in a very short amount of time, we're going to try to answer today, even though that's not easy. It requires a lot of study. It requires a lot of personal reflection. But what we have to define today, how long is forever? We've just read all these verses talking about everlasting fire, everlasting destruction. But what does that mean? Well, the Bible gives us some context in how it uses language. And if we go back to Exodus, we can see one of the Levitical, not Levitical because it's Exodus, but one of the Old Testament laws and sayings here. The Bible says, but if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Well, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that any ancient Israelites are probably still kicking around serving their masters. In the context of this verse, the word forever is essentially meaning until death. I will serve this master for the rest of my life. Now, moving on, also in the Old Testament, in the first Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 22, but Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, not until the child, Samuel, is weaned, then I will take him, and he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever, serving God in his temple forever. But then jumping down to verse 28, it says, therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord, as long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. So clearly Samuel was not to serve the Lord for all eternity in the temple, but just for the rest of his life. That's how the scripture is using the word forever in these circumstances. But we need to see a little bit more context about the judgment itself. Now the Bible says in Jude, Verses 6 and 7. There's no chapters there. Just verses 6 and 7. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, many of us probably remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham and Lot were there. Abraham was praying that hopefully God could save 
these cities because his nephew Lot lived there. But yet, not enough righteous were able to be found, so the Lord determined that it was the greater good for everyone that these cities would cease to exist so that the wickedness that was happening there could not be spread around anywhere else. So God got his faithful people out, Lot and his family. They fled the city, and fire rained down from heaven, and it destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But yet the Bible says that they were to burn with eternal fire. And yet, when we go to the site of where those cities were, the fire isn't burning today. So perhaps it just meant that the results of this fire would be that these cities would no longer exist, ever. It was an eternal judgment. The judgment would never be reversed. The cities will never exist again. But yet the fire is not still burning to this day. When we go to 2 Peter, we get a little bit more context. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Just like destruction came upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked will face a similar destruction because this was an example to them. When type meets anti-type, when the first thing happens, the last will be exactly the same. So now we will dive into the fate of the wicked. What actually happens to them when they face these eternal fires? What does the judgment actually look like? Well, the book of Revelation describes in detail what the judgment looks like. It says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Our God is a fair judge. He is full of justice and mercy. And our God makes sure before everyone to open up the books and make sure that everyone knows exactly what is happening. The scripture goes on. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. It speaks of the resurrection of the dead. They have come forth, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The wicked, once determined to be guilty, They are cast into that fire. And the Bible goes on, and it says, just in the next chapter, And I heard a loud voice from heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he shall be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Now, I don't know about you, but God willing, if I get to stand there in that day, inside the city with the creator of the universe, knowing that perhaps some people that I have met in my life, perhaps some of my loved ones, didn't make it, and that they were outside the city, burning forever, I would still have sorrow. I would still have pain. I would still be tormented, even in the bliss that God offers. But he promised us, he promises us that there would be no more pain. That is not something that we will ever have to worry about again. Perhaps when the wicked are cast into the fire, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, just like what happened to the people in those cities, They cease to exist, just like we saw with the devil and Satan. It says clearly that he will be no more forever. Sin has to be wiped out from the universe because God, as a just God, cannot allow it to ever come back into existence again. All of those who chose to not accept his gift of love, well, God gives them the option to not live with him. He gives us free will, and he has to give us that choice. But God in his love can be merciful, and he cannot allow them to suffer 
but simply wipe out the sin so that they no longer have to be a part of it. That is the grace and the mercy that God allows us all. Now looking more specifically at God's character and what the Bible has to say about God's character. Ezekiel, the Lord says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall not torment. The soul who sins shall die. That is what the scripture teaches. The Bible goes on in Ezekiel. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die? O house of Israel, why? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. God pleads with all of us that he does not want us to die. He wants us to accept the gift that he has given us. He wants everyone to live. That is the character of the God that I serve. Because as the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. God loved us so much that he sent his son to die in our place. Judgment has to be given to everyone. All of us have sinned. All of us deserve to die. But yet, God decided that he would die in our place. So that we, so that no one has to go into that fire. Instead, we get to be in the kingdom with him forever. We serve a God who is, in fact, full of love. The God who gives us all grace a reward that we don't deserve. And he gives mercy to those who choose not to accept it. That is the God that we serve. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, very clear, death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So we have some applications that for me are very helpful. We are free to choose God out of love and not fear. God wants us to choose because of who he is, because of what he did for us to love him. Not because we might face eternal torment if we don't. That is not the God that we serve. Application number two, our loved ones will not burn in torment for eternity. That is not in line with the character of the God of the Bible. Amen. And finally, we do in fact serve a God full of love, grace, and mercy. That is who we serve. 